So I'm delighted to be joined for our Outside the Pegs interview this week by a very recent former European champion and the reigning defending British Masters champion, Mr James Shanes. Hello James and welcome to the podcast. Hey. What nice to be on. It's been a great podcast to listen to the last couple of weeks, so I'm glad I get to do my little bit and hopefully enlighten some of the fans with what goes on. Yeah, that'll be great. It's great to have you on, James, and obviously uh, we've heard some from Graham Hurry already and Mitch Godden and now we've got... Uh, got yourself it's uh, it's really good for us um but first of all james i think what people really want to know is how's all your recovery coming along amazingly um it's been a long road and a slow road but um i've been discharged from the hospital last month i believe i was signed off from them with they're happy with me to get back training and everything um we've had a few step backs with in um i injured my shoulder training and a few little things like that but it's all going well um i'm back in the gym i'm back at work and the bikes are all coming along nicely, so I'm just waiting for the weather to clear up so I can get on and have a little play. Oh, that's brilliant news, James. I mean, I know you probably don't want to de- dwell on it too much, but what was the extent of the injuries in the end? Um, there was a lot of injuries. Um, I broke my T6 and T7. Um, I had a blister on my spinal cord. I smashed, destroyed one of my discs. I had two bruised lungs, a bruised heart, and a Bennett fracture on my thumb. God, that's really nasty. I mean, I've seen a video yeah. of the accident and it was a nasty looking fall. Do you remember much about the crash? <laughs> yeah, that's the worst bit about it. I was conscious for most of the accident until I like went to go take my goggles off because I thought I, was, I thought I was winded. When I take when I get my goggles off and collapse on the floor and wake up in an ambulance on the way to the hospital. Oh, really not good. So, not no. good at all. But obviously, uh, you know, it's probably a, the biggest one you've had to date, and hopefully that's it for crashing for you. But um, fighting fit for 2020, though. Yeah, that's the plan. Um, hopefully, you know, obviously, the first time I get back on the bike, we'll, we'll know more with how the injury is properly. Um, I've been back on the mountain bike and, and all stuff like that, and everything seems normal. Um, I've got very little restricted movement. It's just working out what I need to train on more before the season starts. So hopefully the weather turns so I can actually get back on a bike and try. Yeah, and see how we feel. I mean, in your mind, do you feel like you're ready to get back on the thing? Yeah, I feel ready. Um, you know, also I rode into the HU Awards, awards even last last night, and that was the first time riding in public. So, thankfully, that went well. And I've ridden up and down the drive when trying to get the bikes ready for today or for yesterday, even and for the season. So, you know, it's not it's not knocked my confidence too much. Um, it's just a case of starting off slowly and, and building up into being back on race pace yeah I mean it's going to be a bit of a baptism of fire for you because obviously you're rightly so back in the world long track and obviously the European semi will come up pretty quick and uh, the grass track season will be with us in no time and you've got your speedway as well so big 2020 plan for you again yeah it's going to be a very very busy year Um, they've changed the um, league format slightly on the speedway so it's a league and a little bit of racing so you know, I'm going to be very busy. Um, there's a couple of very busy weeks coming up with um, the fin- Finnish GP and things like that. So it's, you know, exciting times. I'm looking forward to it. Um, it's just getting everyone, the whole team, G'd up, ready to go for what could be a very busy year. Yeah, brilliant. Well, it's really good. Um, if we go back a little bit, James, we've uh, with the other interviewees we've had, we've talked a little bit about their past. And I think we definitely need to talk a bit about what's got you to this point. So we'll go back a little bit, James. And you've always been around grass track your entire life. Obviously, I can remember you... Um, and your mum and dad at racing when dad was riding. I mean, in fact, yeah. my earliest memory of you, I've told you before, is uh, possibly your first meeting at East Ogwell, and it was muddy, and you were on a tiny little PW, I think. And I think that's yeah. why you ended up with the number 93, wasn't it? Yeah, I I wanted to be 193. I wanted to copy dad, but the, the, one, the 193 didn't fit my first number plate, so I had to make a decision of what way I went. So I decided to go 93, and you know, it's kind of stuck ever since. Yeah, but those uh, those early days obviously have sort of turned you into a, a grass tracker out outright. Really, I think that lots of we know that lots of youngsters go off to speedway. But having seen you come up through the ranks of youth, it's difficult to think of you ever going anywhere else. Really, yeah, grass race is is my heart and soul. I, I've done it since I was six and been around it. I think my first meeting I ever went to I was about three months old. So you know, I've been around it my whole life, and obviously my sisters and mum and dad and all been around it so it's 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 home away from home i mean everyone everyone at meetings is it's a second family really so you know i can't see myself ever falling out of love with some grass track it's brush has kept me still on a bike when i've been going through tough times on speed i've been looking like looked forward to getting back out on the grass a bike and just having a ride around in a nice muddy field some days yeah you can't beat it i don't think but uh, through the youth ranks you went and always supported as much of the grass when you were coming through the youth as possible and 
you must have some real fond memories of your youth racing. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a shame to see the youth scene like die off a little bit. I remember riding at Swindon Youth and there being sort of two classes of near enough everyone with 12 riders in each race. And, you know, there was an amazing youth scene. I can remember riding against like the likes of Natalia Willis and Robbie Lambert every so often. And, you know, the the scene was incredible to ride and then it really brought on a lot a lot of the rides were brought on for it and it the southwest scene was 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 very big and had a lot of good riders in as like me and zach both came through the sort of southern juice scene so it definitely made some good riders and it was great fun to be a part of there. yeah definitely and it was um it's it's with something we've talked about on the podcast ourselves and we're not sure what what the reason is really for it sort of going quiet over the last few years i mean the southwest scene like you said we used to have a lot of re- meetings down this way in the southwest and that's obviously a big factor but yeah it's just not as strong anymore it's a real shame yeah it's hard to pinpoint like why it's gone but i know obviously the speedway scene the youth speedway is kicked off massively and they do sort of under 21 do like two-day training camps here there and everywhere they have riders coming and train them and there's a lot more of a youth scene in in speedway so where before we used to sort of go through youth grass track and then you'd go to speedway but you still do a little bit of grass track i think now you can start speedway at such like a lot earlier so people just go straight to speedway and never even consider going to grass track which is a massive shame yeah big shame but having said that there's a lot of quick lads coming through at the minute i mean we've got sort of jake mulford who's just about to join in the adults and Henry Atkins has been about not really had a proper go on the 500s he's had a couple of meetings but not a real real go Charlie Brooks obviously as well and then if we look a bit a bit bef- you know the ones coming into the adults Cameron Taylor Mickey Simpson yeah. and, and then this year that junior class has been amazing so oh, um, yeah, some of the junior races I've, I've watched I don't know about sort of you know five minutes and watch some of the junior races have been absolutely amazing um and to be like Jake Mulford's on it at the minute. Um, I've had the other pleasure now with um, someone for like he's got some of my old bikes now, and just with paired him up with Roger RTS to sort of give him the best the best footing he can possibly have, and some of the things that I didn't have when I was sort of younger and like knowledge wise that I needed, I sort of passed on to him and to Cameron and to try some of the younger riders because in sort of ten years time, I want my I want to be fighting for my my Team GB sport and my long track sport. I want to be fighting for it with another young British rider. So. You know, I'd pass on all my knowledge that I've got to them. Hopefully, they use it, use it in sort of step forward. Yeah, it must be quite exciting for you because uh, obviously you're only twenty, just well, twenty two now, and in yeah. ten years' time, they're all going to be in the adults and they're going to be around. All that junior class are going to be sort of seventeen, eighteen. It must be really exciting yeah. to be to be able to be a part of that one day. Yeah, it's, don't get me wrong. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna dread the day that I've said I, I help them and they use my <laughs> against me. I'm gonna dread that day, but you know, <laughs> England is. England has got such a good. There's still such so many like young riders that can make it in the sport, and uh, some some of the some some of the means it comes down to budget and to knowledge. And if I can pass on my knowledge to some of the some of the riders, and you know, I help Jake out with all my old clutch plates and my old tires and stuff like that that are still usable for him that I've I can't use anymore. It saves him. It saves them a little bit, and I've done it with Cameron as well. So it's exciting times to see where they can go with. You know the sort of pedestal they've been given. I know Carl Russian is doing this show to try and give you know us sort of a you know stage to shout from, and if we can show how great the sport is, hopefully we'll have a bit of a revamp in it. Yeah, we hope so. And uh, obviously yourself, like when you went into the uh, into the adults, I think that the the, the yeah, sort of intermediate class had gone a little bit quiet when you come into the adults, and so you hit the adults in the two hundred and fifty class and immediately on the pace. So that must have been really exciting for you when you first come up into the adults. Yeah, I didn't really expect to gel that quickly with being in the adults um you know I saw so I kind of jumped on the 250 and I found I found my feet on the 250 and I can remember going to um I think my first adult meeting was at uh, Bristol a couple of days after my birthday and um went out for practice and come back in and said practice is absolute carnage with our brights and any anything you can imagine on the track <laughs> at the same time and coming from the youth where there's only sort of six of you on the track at the same time to suddenly have 12 of you was quite a quite a shock to the system but it was good fun and you know riding against dad was always interesting and you know good fun on the way home and I, I would, he would, he would bully me in the first quarter or try to and then I would replay him in the conference so we had good fun on the way home after having a good meeting together yeah, yeah good stuff I suppose I forgot that you and your dad would have raced at the same time I think it's uh yeah not many of us get to do that but 
Yeah, good fun, Sounds and then great. obviously, yeah, I bet. And then, um, yeah, you rode in a lot of British grass tracks when you first sort of came up, and you, you know, with the two hundred and fifty, and then the bit of the three hundred and fifty, and then the obviously the five hundred as well. And lots of British grass tracks all over the place at club level and everything. And do you think that was a really valuable experience doing that? Yes, I, I, I love it. I love riding in England. Love supporting. What's if it wasn't for English grass track, I wouldn't be where I am now. So I still like to support as many as I can. And it's helped me out in so many ways. Even on speedway, we've been to some. I've been to some very dodgy speedway tracks, and being a grass track rider, and it's never hasn't phased me. I sort of just worked out how to get on with it and got on with it. I've, in the in the pouring rain, or if the track's been knee deep, hasn't really bothered me. And you know, that's massive thanks to the grass tracks, really. Yeah, and nowadays you uh, obviously have got a lot of commitments with the. Uh, well, not so much the speedway, but the the continental con- the contracts you have over there. But you still pop up on the odd grass track over here. Uh, is there any tracks yeah. really that you sort of like riding over here? I like riding Lebrys tracks. Um, Lebrys been a good a good hunting ground for me since I was young, and I've, I've joined Lebrys as a club member. So to you know, I like to pay it back to them. I, go, I try and go to Lebry always at the start of the year. Um, Wimborne put a good meeting on. And so does Astra. I love going to them sort of tracks. Um, I'm kind of upset that um, like Rose Minnis and places like that have gone because I'd, I'd love to ridden Rose Minnis and Collier Street um, and places like that, but unfortunately they disappeared before I got to go to ride properly. But yeah, it's one of them things. Unfortunately, isn't it? Yeah, I think you probably just just missed out Collier Street. I think you did it as a youth. I think you rode it, didn't you? Yeah, I think I rode it when it was half boarded on the 250, or 250, 350 time. Mm. Um, and the first one I rode on 350, I blew Dad's 350 up. <laughs> Um, he wasn't really impressed with me. No. Um, if it's not bad yeah, enough so that you're beating him every weekend, you then blowing his bike up as well. Yeah, he wasn't very impressed. No. Um, yeah, yeah, it was good fun, but it's a shame some of these good tracks have gone. But there's still there's still a few about. I, I try to go to as many as I can and support the people that supported me when I was younger. Yeah, I think that a lot of uh, I think we all know that despite the fact that people work tirelessly on uh, venues and tracks, we're not spoiled like we are, like they are in Germany and uh, and France and sort of holland as well but you know we've got some decent tracks and there's some bloody good racing as well and um luke obviously our co-host he's heavily involved in frittenden club and we haven't seen you at frittenden for a few years and he'd kill me if i didn't ask are you likely to ride at frittenden in 2020 i don't know it all depends on on the calendar really um sometimes i get an odd weekend off and i just need i need some time off i've been i've been flat out for a couple weeks before i just need to put my feet up for five minutes but it's very hard to try and balance you know wanting to ride and support all these local tracks but trying to not overdo it too much and cause myself more harm so it's quite a dodgy it's quite hard to balance it but if the schedule allows me i'll definitely turn up and have a little go excellent well just thinking back again from your your uh some of your highlights your career obviously your first british masters was at swingfield uh which is where the masters is this year uh, back in not very long ago 2014 I'm saying back like it was ages ago it's not been very long <laughs> and uh, in many ways I think it marked your arrival in the sport I mean you sort of you'd done a bit of winning and been around a little bit but you got to that Masters and still very young but managed to finish fourth overall so yeah I reckon yeah. that was you arriving on the scene yeah it was it was um, a very surreal day like mum and dad said they've watched the Masters final for years and all of a sudden they're pushing me out into the Masters final with a chance of me getting on the podium and you know, I was looking up to sort of like Andrew Apple and David Howe and all the likes of these people are still idols to me. And next thing I know, I was in between, I think I was in between David and Andrew and I was being shoved, I think David was shoving me into Andrew to try and, you know, get an advantage. And it was a great experience to be part of. And it definitely did sort of mark almost the start of it, like the start of the big climb for me, really. And I did enjoy every minute of that day. Yeah. And then obviously the following year, you won your first one. Yeah, I think it was at Wimborne I won the first meet, yeah. the first um, my first Masters, and it was it was a, such a thrill, um, just an odd experience. I, it was one of them days I just couldn't really say what happened, but it all clicked into winning my first Masters at my local track, and everything like that was just absolutely amazing. I still I still remember that day, you know, like it was just yesterday. Yeah, it was brilliant, and uh, your reaction as you come over the line. I mean, you were just you could see you were absolutely elated with what had just happened and it was it was great to see and obviously from those of us that had watched you ride since you were six years old coming through and then winning the Masters and there was a lot of um, Speedway wildcards that had been thrown into the mix for that day as well so for you to, to make them all look a bit silly and just smash a lot of them on that day it was put a smile on a lot of grass track fans' faces I think. Yeah, you know you don't really get days like that now, like everything just goes right and it was one of them days I just couldn't 
I was absolutely nervous the day before. I was in, I was, I was a wreck the day before, and um, I went out with a couple of my friends for dinner and whatnot to try and keep my mind off it, and turned up and just did it. And at the end of it, it was such a an emotional evening. Um, I think we ended up going to my grandma's, and by the time I got from the track to my grandma's, it was like ten minutes down the road. I polished off a whole bottle of champagne, and <laughs> I was a giggly mess for the rest of the night. But it was, it was such a good experience, and. You know, that it really did mark the start of everything. And, you know, I won that meeting on, you know, a second hand. I was, I, was, I was riding the same bike I had in the Inters, was the bike I rode in that meeting. I was in a second hand suit um, and all of that stuff. And it really sort of gave me the push I needed and the backing I needed to make the step up to sort of like the GP and the European levels. Yeah, it was definitely. I mean, obviously, then you went on, you won that one and then you won it again two times after and the first person ever to outright win i mean calvin tatum won it three times but he had to share it one time but you were the first person to win it three times in a row but then zach got the better of you at cheshire yeah that was a, a hard day it was i was having a good day and till the final i got a puncher um you know the worst bit was i put a new tire in for the final and must about the second second or third lap in i got a puncher um but all credit to zach he, he was riding very well that day and anyway so you know, whether I would have beaten him without the puncher, I don't know. Um, it was a very tricky track there, but a very fun track to ride at Cheshire. And um, all credit to him, he, he won. And it's great to see that it's not just the sort of two young riders that are at the forefront of British racing. Yeah, it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And again, yeah, Cheshire was a real challenging track we've talked about before. It was uh, not for the faint-hearted, I don't think. But we had two lads who have no. come up through the ranks on the grass. Uh, didn't phase you. Um, but for a punter, no, it was a you might have been grass track, really. <laughs> oh, yeah, and some, I think. Only way to describe it, it was, it was a proper meeting. <laughs> yeah, it certainly yeah. was. Yeah, it was something to watch. But then last year, Dig Dog Lane of in 2019, you went through the card unbeaten and won your fourth British Masters. Yeah, Dig Dog Lane again. It was just one of them days. Um, just worked perfectly for me. I, it really did. I don't know what I did, but it worked. I spent the whole meeting putting teeth on, which is quite rare. You normally taking teeth off as a meeting go on. But I said to Dad after practice, that's fine leave it I went out for the first race put a tooth on put a tooth on put a tooth on I just couldn't you know I was worried about not being able to survive four laps and for the final I said to dad I've got to make a gamble and he said what are you going to drop a tooth and I said no I'm going to put another tooth on which shocked dad completely he wasn't expecting me to turn around and say that to him and you know it was a case of make, make the start and take control of the first corner and um, in, there's a photo somewhere of in the first corner I completely lost the front end of the bike yeah um <laughs> God knows how I saved it, but I came back to Dad's. I've lost the front end going into the first corner. He said, "I oh, didn't." And then the photo surfaced, and I showed him, and he was like, "How you stayed on? I don't know, but <laughs> I stayed on." And then again, it was an emotional, an emotional day because the whole family was there, which is, um, you know, very rare. Do I get the whole the whole family turn up, sisters and nieces and nephew, and all of them turned up. So. It was a proper family experience for the day. All of your titles have come from the uh, winner-take-all final, but you've gone through the card each time and I'm un- unbeaten. Uh, and obviously, there, if you'd have uh, if you'd have dropped it at that first corner, it would have been an absolute travesty. Like you, you know, yeah, what do you feel them, about um, that one-off, fi- uh, the winner-take-all uh, final? It's it saved my se- it saved me several times and it's cost me for um, um, like my first European title. I was for one of the words I was at the meeting and I went into the B final last qualifier and went through to win the meeting and then this year at the European final it cost me dearly but it just depends on what day you're having if you're having, a, if you're having an unbeaten day you want points but if you're having a bad day you want some benefits yep. one of them things really yeah I'm glad you brought up the European final because uh, obviously that was at Swingfield too um, in 2016 um, and it was just the yeah, you, you looked like you were completely out of the meeting and then right at the end everything just turned around and uh, you became the European champion. Yeah, it was a um, a Disney ending really. Um, <laughs> I had a disaster of day. I had gearbox problems, engine problems, crashes, belts. You sort of name it, I had it. It was such an emotional day. I was won a race and then I had a DNF and then won a race DNF and going into the B final, Dad said to me, this is good enough. Like, you've made the B final, you've had not disgraced yourself and I remember coming off the start and by the end of the second or third lap getting behind Pepe Frank in second and I thought to myself, do I race Pepe or do I just sit here? And, you know, I made the decision to sit behind him, take second into the, to, and go to the final and went to pick my gate and for some reason I decided I wanted um, green. Well, green was the best gate for me that day. Walked into, walked into the tent to pick my gate and there was green sat there. 
in front of me. So I came back to the van with a complete different attitude, with the attitude that it was it was it was my my, my chance to take it. And unfortunately, the, the first running of the final got stopped. Um, real very hard decision on Yannick to exclude him. There was a lot of, lot of, lot of shoving in the first corner, but you know to then pull off a, another start the same was amazing. Yeah. And it was one of, them, one of the longest four laps I've ever done. By the end of it, things were, you know, rattling and I was hearing things and just wanting the bike to get across the line and to cross the line and to realise that I'd done it in Kent. At the time, I was riding for Kent and in England in front of all the fans. It was just, you know, one of the one of the highlights of my career that so far. Yeah, absolutely. And then obviously the following year, you defended the title in uh, in Germany. A brilliant night for British riders. That was a very, um, very um, British track. Um, I remember going... When I walked the track, and as I was going onto the track, Charlie Powell was coming off, and he turned around and said, "It's Bristol." I thought, "What do you mean it's like Bristol?" He said, oh, "It's just exactly the same as Bristol, like the very first track they had." Walked the track, come off, and I said, "Dad, it's, like, it's Bristol." And that was one of them days again. I nothing went wrong. I had a few problems in practice. I him out for the meeting and just went through the meeting without, a, with no problems, no drama, no sweat, which is, you know, the complete opposite of how I did it the first time. Yeah. Yeah, a bit more plain sailing for for the second title, but uh, obviously next year we've got the final at Midshires, so chance of having it again, but winning it at home again. Yeah, that would be amazing if I could win it again and do it on home soil again would be absolutely amazing. So I think there's only two other riders that have won three European titles, I think. So to join, you know, a very sort of elite group to have three to my name would be absolutely amazing. And again, to do it up, like in England is just it's such a, a surreal experience you can't really describe it. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be a lot of people uh, cheering you on, I'm sure, at the... Uh, well, we've got to get through the semi-final yet, of course. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's always the stumbling block. Yeah, we've got Tyak, uh, which I'm guessing you would rather opt for Bielefeld because of uh, Tyak, of course, clashes with the world long track. Yeah, I've, I've, yeah, that's that's it. And Tyak's a, a speed of my track. Bielefeld's a, a grass track. And I've done well. I've ridden Bielefeld two or three times now and I've loved riding it, so given the choice, I would, you know, I would choose um, Bielefeld over Tyak any day. Yeah, well, I think that uh, most people have, yeah, well, the four of us had looked at the the riders going, and we'd looked at where to put you all, and we said, well, James has got to go to Bielefeld, like that'll be the that'll be perfect for him. So, yeah, um, yeah hopefully we get all eight of you in the final, and then who knows? Yeah, God, it'd be, it would be it would be an awesome thing to have all eight in the um, you know the final of the final. That that be that would be an amazing thing, and really want it, but. You know, it's going to be a hard push with Kenneth Hansen going so well and did very well round um, mid as well. So, yeah, you know, we see if we can pull off another all-Brit podium, but, you know, who knows what's going to happen on the day. Let's hope so. We'll have our fingers crossed. But um, moving away from the European into the World Long Track Series, obviously you've been a regular in the World Long Track Series since 2017 now, so fairly well experienced in it. Um, you must be delighted to, to get back into it for 2020. Yeah, I was, you know, when I, I saw the the picks that the AC put forward to work I've been me and Zach I was you know I thought they would, you know, Zach was going to get the choice been the European champion and you know me coming out with injury I wasn't sure how they were going to look at that but to get the phone call to say I was had the wild card really helped me through recovery because it gave me a purpose that I had I had I was back where I started and I could train to to go back to where I left off and you know, it's difficult this year with um, going to Forza and mauled off the two tracks. I, well, I'm not really a thousand meter rider yet, so I'm struggling on the really big tracks. And you know, to see Enron disappear, which is a track that I've done very well at yeah. and very badly at. But you know, it's hopefully we're going to see how they go with the thousand meter tracks. I've been working with Roger RTS and Tornado to try and work out a few little things to try and give me a little bit of an edge over a few riders. Yeah, we've talked a little bit on the podcast about um, about the long track series and about the. Uh, well, you know, Forza and Moldorf obviously are what we would describe as um, long tracks. Herxheim, perhaps, as well. But Larry Ole's a grass track in our mind, and the Polish one is not anywhere near a grass track or a long track. So, no, yeah, you've no. got to be really adaptable. <laughs> but... Yeah, that's the problem with the last the GP the last few years. It's been so the track's been so variant. It's quite hard to sort of get yourself into a rhythm. You be at Moldorf one day, and then next round you're at, you know, Endrum. And yeah. the tracks are so different, and engines are so different. It's quite difficult to sort of get yourself set up for them but I guess at the end of it you get a proper world champion but whether it's a long track champion I'm going to love the debate really isn't it yeah it certainly is but um, obviously La I think is somewhere that you enjoy riding And um, but the inter- the, the Speedway one will be interesting I would have thought yeah it would be interesting it would be very difficult riding the Speedway track with a 22 a 22 tyre but mm. you know it's one of the challenges of the night um, I know they went there 
a couple of years ago now, and you know they had heard good things about it. Um, but then I believe they didn't ride in the Polish league last year or the year before they went in the Polish league because the track needed too much work doing to it. So they've obviously redone the track and they're back in the Polish league, I believe, and we're going there. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, it's been a dream to ride in Poland, so at least I'm, you know, I'm getting a ride in Poland either way. So. Yeah. <laughs> Been experience. Yeah, well, best of luck with that. Obviously, um, you know, we'll all be behind all of you. It'd be great to see Zach get into a few as well and have all of you in there. But um, it's a, a good position that our country's in at the moment, in, the, in as much that both yourself and Zach would have been perfect candidates for that wild card. But um, I think, given the fact that you were already placed in a qualifying position when you got injured, it's the right, definitely the right decision. Not taking it away from Zach, of course, he's our European champion, but um, it's a real luxurious position we're in at the moment yeah it's it's amazing to see how many riders or things that have you know you can sit there for the european and you know you get eight places for the european final or the semis and there's sort of you know you could double the riders that we've got available to do it and that are good enough to do it so you know i it'll be nice to see in the next few years some of the um some of the older riders sort of step down from the ranks and allow the maybe less experienced riders to step up and you know, have their go and get the experience that they need out there to keep progressing. Well, we we'll wait and see. Obviously, um, we've talked a bit about the the World Long Track Series on here, and uh, there's been a few. Well, we've got a few grumblings, and obviously Graham Hurry we spoke to the other week, and he's got a few grumblings. But obviously, you're a rider competing in it, and yeah, how how do you feel about the tournament itself? It's it's, it's a well run thing. I mean, they've made a few changes again for this year. They've changed a few things, like how these, the points are and and is that which make it different. Whether it's better or worse, I don't really know. But you know, it's not a I don't class it as a long track World Series anymore. Like you said, we're going to um, Rezo, Rezo, however you say it. Um, don't ask me bear, mate. I is, get nothing but grief oh. for my pronunciation <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've tried I've tried it so many times I, I give up I give yeah. up trying to pronounce some <laughs> of the tracks um, it, it's not really a, it's not a long track and you know Larry O's debatable whether you could class it as a long track you know it's a I think it's like 850 metres so you know you could class it as a long track if you wanted but you know it's not the same as sort of going to like Farkirk in and Muldorf and you know some of the true thousand meter tracks which you would call work like a long track but uh, sadly there's not many of them still about so it's you know adapting it and twisting it to sort of meet modern times but yes yeah, I enjoy riding in it so it's, it's hard to sort of comment on it yeah fair enough well yeah I think that what you said at the top there was uh, it's very well run and I think you can't argue that it's very well organized um, some really good backers but uh, it's just I think it's just moved away a little bit from what we love as grass track fans, and I think that we struggled to deal with that a little bit, maybe. Yeah, it is. It is hard with six rides, well, five rides now. You know, it is hard with five rides on the track. It's racing is not not the best. So, you know, it'd be nice to see them almost do two series, have like a, a long track series and a, a track racing series, almost. You know, have the two different disciplines as two separate championships, which would, you know, possibly an idea whether they look into it in the next couple of years I don't know now Glenn's come on board he's you know looking at looking as a more of a rider point of view what would he like to do when trying to make it you know modernise it a little bit more which is can only be a good thing really yeah hopefully that something comes about because uh, yeah like we say it's a great tournament but I reckon a few tweaks it'd be even better just to finish off really you've achieved an awful lot in the sport I don't think people realise you're still only 22 I know you're 23 very shortly, I think. Is that right? Yeah, I'm 23 in March. So yeah, so still really young, but yeah, getting old. <laughs> Be on the upright soon. Build a jap. Yeah. Hey, I, I have thought about it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, what do you hope to achieve? Like, if, if you, you've got your whole career really still in front of you, what is it that your aims are for, for the whole of your career that's left? I would love to beat Simon Wig to be the you know most successful rider that is has to be my goal I think it's five or six masters titles he won so I'd love to you know go you know, go at least one better than him and try and become the most successful rider in the European Championships and to try and win a world title of my own you know it was a great honour to win it with Team GB that like, year it was a great experience but I'd love to sort of win an individual world title to you know for myself and yeah well, I mean, yeah, it's an individual. Like it's an individual sport. It's at its heart, yeah. really. It's not a team sport, grass track and long track. So that's understandable that you want to win some some titles. But yeah, Simon Wig is uh, five times British Masters champion, and you've only got to win one more to equal him. Um, yeah, so that's it'd be great well in... to go one more. That's that's the like, one more. Would be amazing if I could go even more. Again, that'd be 
absolutely amazing. It was a great achievement to be Joe Screen to the youngest, the youngest one to win. It was a, you know, sort of feather in the cap. And yeah. the day after I won it, I had a message from him saying, you know, congratulations and, and things like that. So hopefully, I can follow follow in the footsteps of you know, arguably the greatest rider and an idol of mine and many many riders. So hopefully I can you know, go in his footsteps. Yeah, hopefully so. I mean, we'll be looking out for you, and uh, all the, we're really hoping that you can pull something off at Midshires for that European. Uh, all the best for the uh, World Long Track as well, James. We'll be keeping an eye on your results and making sure that you're uh, coping with some of those unfamiliar conditions as well as you can. Um, but yeah. <laughs> best of luck for the 2020 season, and thanks for joining us on the Grass Track Banter podcast. Anytime, I've been on.